Welcome to Western Technical College Business and Industry Services. This video, along with other training opportunities from Western BIS, are designed to help employees stay informed on the latest trends in today's changing workplace. To learn how Western can support your business, visit us at westerntc.edu slash BIS. Um, so yeah, my name is Casey Meehan, um, the Director of Sustainability and Resilience at Western. Um, and today what I was really uh, hoping to uh, help you think through and make some sense of is three different things. First, I want to help develop your understanding just of the interconnectedness of all these problems that we face um, right now, especially, you know, pretty trying times that we're, that we're in right now. Um, I want to secondly help build a little bit of awareness to what's called the United Nations Global Goals and try to connect you to those a little bit as a way of connecting you to, to sustainability. And then third, I'd like to introduce just a few um, resources that, that you might use or think about to get you started if you're just starting sort of down this path of, you know, what is sustainability. So to start with, um, this is kind of the most common definition of sustainability that you see out there. So it's meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And really this developed, um, this, this definition came about in 1987. Um, and it was in response to a lot of the environmental um, issues that the world started seeing in the 70s. And so the UN put together a panel to, um, to develop a definition and some, some um, language around what needed to be moving forward with the world if we were to, basically if we were to survive. And so the, the report that came out was, it's commonly called the Brundtland Report, um, although it's, I think it's, uh, the official name is Our Common Future. It came out in 1987, and this was the definition of sustainability that they used. So this is the one that we see sort of around the world. Now, I'm not sure about you, but to me, this is sort of a downer of a definition. Um, it, it connotes a bit of sacrifice, right? And getting by, like it's, it's um, you know, if we, just, uh, if we just do a little bit less bad, then we can pass on the status quo to the, to the next generation. Um, it's just, it's, it's not a very compelling definition. Um, sometimes when I talk about sustainability in this definition, I oftentimes um, compare it to, you know, how, how might you describe your relationship? So I certainly wouldn't describe my relationship with my partner as sustainable with this definition, right? Oh, it's, you know, it's fine. We're getting by, um, you know, I guess it meets our needs. Oh, that's, that to me isn't a very compelling reason to do anything, right? So I like to flip it a little bit and um, think about sustainability rather as this. In fact, this is the definition that we use at Western. It's the act of building a just, resilient, and thriving community now and in the future. So with this sort of spin on sustainability, it's really all about helping all people thrive, right? Within ecological constraints, of course, but helping people thrive. It's not just getting by. It's not just doing less bad. It's thriving. And so what does it actually take to thrive? Um, well, I mean, of course, there's clean air and clean water, right? If we don't have those, then we don't survive. Um, of course, there's food and healthy food, right? That's, that helps us thrive. Um, but there's lots of other things that help us, helps us really thrive. It's not, those are things that just help us get by, right? To really thrive, we need healthy food, fresh food. We need um, uh, validation of who we are, no matter how we look or how we identify, if we're really going to thrive, we need access to education and other services. We need access to healthcare. We need um, uh, good health in general if we're really going to thrive. We need a living wage and jobs that matter. Um, we need connection to other people. Um, we need voices, uh, a voice in, in the decisions that are made that affect us. Um, and then you know, another thing that helps us thrive is downtime. We need that. Humans need space to be creative and, and just rest their brain. Um, these are all things that help us with thriving, right? So that's more than just getting by. We want people to actually thrive. Now, this to me is really exciting stuff, right? I mean, imagine, imagine what the world would be like if we all had these things, if we were all actually thriving. And so again, sustainability is not just plodding along, 
hoping to pass along some semblance of the status quo to another generation. Um, it's, it's much more than that. And in fact, with the recent events of COVID and Black Lives Matter, um, you know, those have really made us more aware uh, than ever before that passing along normal and just trying to get back to normal, that's not okay any, anymore. So we need to be thinking more about this idea of thriving and sustainability. So in 2015, the United Nations or the UN rolled out a series of 17 um, goals that address some of those, the most pressing challenges of, um, of the world right now. And these goals, if we achieve them, are really supposed to help us live in a more sustainable world by 2030, which absolutely is, um, is a stretch, you know, in general, it's just a stretch, right? Um, the plan, these global goals are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but right now it's the best plan we have so far to improve life, not only for us, but, but for our kids and our kids' kids. And again, it's not perfect, but I like thinking through this model and I like help, helping others, whether it's in their personal life or um, in businesses, I like helping people think through this model for two reasons. So first of all, these 17 different goals um, really shakes us out of this idea of siloed thinking. So which is siloed thinking is how we got into this mess to begin with, right? So we, we separated good health and well-being from poverty and from inequality. And we separated uh, um, life on land or, you know, how we treat the land and how we treat animals from decent work and from affordable energy. All of these things are interconnected. So these goals, when we see them all together like this really reminds us that this is a holistic thing, right? It gives us a holistic view of what sustainability really is. And all of these different areas get at the idea of thriving. Um, so if we look at, you know, if we break down these goals a little bit, um, we can look at issues, some of them are looking at issues of fairness and equality. Um, some of them, oh, and it looks like it froze here. Let me try this again. Yeah, there we go. Okay, great. So some of these goals um, are really about issues of fairness and equality, right? So ensuring people have equitable access to basic services like clean water, like healthcare, like food, nutritious food, like energy. Um, it also deals with issues of fairness and equality by simply trying to reduce inequality, by providing quality education to everybody, uh, looking at gender equality, um, looking at pulling people out of poverty, giving people decent uh, jobs and, and hoping that the economy grows from that. The goals also really address climate change, which is um, obviously a, a big thing in, in today's world right now. Um, and they do that by fostering innovation and resilience in our businesses and in our communities. Um, of course, caring for the environment, right? And they do that all while promoting peace and collaboration and transparent decision-making. So really good, strong, um, democratic governments that allow people to help make the decisions. So again, these, these goals really, I think, help to connect the dots to the world's greatest challenges. So rampant inequality that we're facing right now, climate change, COVID, all of them are connected. And each goal is also split into um, target areas that can be measured. So, so these aren't just real amorphous goals. There, there's actually target measures that we can, that we can check out. Um, and if you're, if you're ever interested in knowing more, um, globalgoals.org has all of them, um, all of them listed in here. And it's a, this is a great site. Um, so for example, we can look at, um, Oh, I don't know. Let's look at good health and well-being. So this tells us exactly what this goal is all about. Gives you a little bit of a background on it. And then um, if you keep scrolling down, it gives you the, the exact targets. So this is these are what um, the specific targets for good health and well-being is all about. And then at the very bottom, it gives you suggestions on things to do, how you can spread the word, how do you stay updated. So globalgoals.org, it's a great website to, to learn more about these goals. 
the other, the, the second um, reason why I really like this framework in general is that um, all these goals are really all connected, right? So that work in any one of them can help other goals advance, but only obviously only if that work doesn't contribute to extractive economy type stuff. So for example, um, decent work, if we're focused on goal number eight, decent work and economic growth, um, that's great if we want our economy to grow, right? But if we're doing it by clear cutting the forests and overfishing, well, that's actually not helpful, help, helpful if we're trying to get everybody to thrive, right? So if we really think holistically and intentionally about what we're trying to do with the goal and try to, we, we can actually push forward a bunch of these other goals. So I would, I would say, as you're looking at these goals right now, um, the thing to ask yourself is what do you already do in service to one or more of these goals? And how does achieving this goal help solve other pressing challenges? So again, lots of times with sustainability, people think it's just about, you know, the planet, right? And, and being environmentally conscious. That's not true. It's about all of these things. And if you're doing any one of these things, you're actually contributing to these goals. Again, if you're doing it mindfully. So how exactly are you connecting with this? What is, um, you know, whether it's where you're working or in your home life or just what you're passionate about, I guarantee that all of us have at least one of these goals that we're passionate about. And so what are you doing there? What, how, how are you actually connecting to this bigger thing called sustainability? And then expand that a little bit and say, well, by, by me working on, for example, you know, one of the things that I work on a lot is quality education and another one is climate action. So climate action, I know by me working on climate action, I'm also helping with no poverty because we know that, um, that the effects of climate change disproportionately impact people in poverty. And so the, the more that we can help reduce climate change, the better off, the, the better off it is for, for people in poverty, right? Um, I'm also, by doing that, I'm also contributing to goal number seven, affordable and clean energy. So I can, and, and that again connects to poverty, right? If we can reduce people's utility bills and do it in a way that actually is healthy, um, that's great. That's, that's hitting multiple goals. So uh, one other question you might ask yourself about these is um, which of these goals, if addressed, would help you solve your goal? So in some cases, there are certain, some of these goals are maybe more important in some economies or some areas of the world more than others. So for example, in um, the global south, right? So if we're looking at like sub-Saharan Africa, um, no poverty is a really big thing. And if we address no poverty, that's going to make achieving a lot of these other goals much easier. In the U.S., poverty is an issue, but not nearly the abject poverty that we see in some other countries. So for us, it might be sustainable cities. Goal number 11 is one of those sort of fulcrum goals that we want to think about. Because if we can make sustainable cities and communities, that's going to impact lots of these other ones. So Another way to think through all these 17 goals is which one of these do you think is, has the most impact as far as addressing a lot of the other goals? So the next thing that comes to mind is what can you actually do about all this? And it looks like, let me try this again. All right, great. So what can you actually do about all this? Um, Sustainability can be a really heavy topic, especially when we start talking about things like COVID and Black Lives Matter and climate change and environmental degradation. Um, the first thing you can do is stop feeling guilty. Um, I am a firm believer that there is enough shame already in this world um, that we don't need to be feel guilty and shameful about one other thing, right? Um, instead, be curious, be intentional, about looking for wonder in the world and just beauty in the world, right? And being open-minded to change. Um, and, and what also goes along with this stop feeling guilty is the second bullet, which is think sustainability we, right? So individual efforts are absolutely necessary, but they're not sufficient, right? So we need massive collective effort. And by collective effort, I'm talking about getting our businesses behind this and getting our policymakers on board with this. This is not just an individual problem. Big corporations have made it, and, and governments for that matter, have made it really convenient to scapegoat individuals 
So it's lots of like, well, what can you do about climate change? Well, again, that's, it's important that we individually take some actions, but all of our actions added up together aren't going to be enough. We need massive system change. So start thinking about sustainability. We, how do we, you know, how do we contact elected officials or local leaders, business leaders, whatever, and, and get them to, to understand that this is important? How do we, um, you know, what types of policies are they voting for or enacting? How do we, um, how do we open up that dialogue with them? So it's important that this is really a collective action. Again, not, I'm certainly not negating the individual action, right? There are certain things that we can, we can absolutely do um, that are good for sustainability, but also just good for all sorts of other things, your, your pocketbook for one thing, right? Um, and your health. So one thing, uh, the, the third thing is just know where you are. And by that, I mean benchmark, um, benchmark what you're doing. There are some, um, some interesting tools out there to do that. If you're interested in doing this in, on a household level or an individual level, your footprint calculator is one. So footprintcalculator.org is a tool, an online tool that's um, totally free to use. I think you have to sign up for it, but it's, but it's free. Um, and it takes you through uh, basically your household and says, well, let's look at, um, you know, what, what's your diet look like? What is your, how many cars do you have? How often do you drive? How often are you flying? How big is your house? Um, what's your typical heating bill? Uh, and then it gives you what your, what your footprint is, your ecological footprint is on the planet. So in other words, how many resources do you take up compared to, um, compared to average, whether that's in the US or in the world? Uh, it's sort of interesting. Earth Overshoot Day. I don't know if anyone's heard of that top, uh, that that term before, but Earth Overshoot Day is August 22nd this year. Um, Earth Overshoot is the day that uh, when humanity's demand for ecological resources, so for for natural resources in any given year, exceeds what the Earth can actually generate in that year. So by August 22nd, as a planet, this year by August 22nd, we will have exceeded the resources that the planet Earth can actually produce for that year. Um, and that day has actually been pushed back. It was in July sometime, but because of the, the pandemic and businesses and travel being shut down, basically, um, Earth Overshoot Day is actually bounced back by a couple of days, 10 days or so, um, or, or maybe even more than that this year. But it's an, it's an interesting tool to use to figure out, well, what is my particular impact? I think... The last number I remember seeing is that if the rest of the globe, the, if the rest of humanity lived like the average American does, we would need something like four and a half or five Earths to, um, to provide for all of us. So there's certainly things that we can do, right? The other, um, the other benchmarking tool, which is really fascinating to me, is the slaveryfootprint.org. So... Um, the slaveryfootprint.org looks at um, where you get your stuff um, and how many, um, essentially how many slaves are used to make your stuff because slavery is still happening around the world, especially when we're importing stuff from, from um, other countries. They're not up and up with their labor practices as I'm sure everyone's aware of, right? And so, um, so how, many, how many people are actually are you responsible for through your purchasing? Um, I think it's, again, just an eye-opening um, eye tool to use. And then the fourth, uh, the fourth thing, as far as what you can do, is to take actions that multi-solve. So I love this term multi-solving. Um, I wish I could come up with it, but I was the one that came up with it, but, but I'm not, and I'm completely drawing a blank on the, on the woman who did. Um, but multi-solving, uh, is this idea of taking, um, of, of taking one action that can actually address more than one of those UN goals or just that, it, that addresses more um, or that helps solve more problems than just one. So for example, um, this is a, a really easy example to, to think about multi-solving on and that is reducing your meat intake, um, which I know, I, listen, I'm a born and raised Wisconsinite. I know that saying like reducing our meat intake is something that's almost sacrilege. Um, but it's also probably the best, um, 
em empirically sort of figured out through science that this is probably the most effective action that an American can take um, if we want to reduce if, if you want to reduce your um, your footprint on climate change is to reduce your meat intake. Um, and I'm not talking about totally vegetarian. I'm just saying even one day a week, right? Not eating meat one day a week, that would go a long way. But if we think about multi-solving, well, so one problem that that helps solve, it certainly doesn't do the whole thing, but it helps solve climate change, right? It also helps solve um, or address the good health and well-being. There are all sorts of studies out there, really strong evidence that red meat is not good for humans. Um, it does all sorts of nasty stuff to our body. So it helps that, right? Um, it helps with goal number 15, which is, um, or 14, which, 14, no, 15, which is life on land. Um, that's biodiversity, right? And, and forests and things, things like that. We are cutting acres and acres and acres of rainforest down um, daily in, in the Amazon, mainly to graze cattle. Um, that, so then that, that cattle can get, you know, sold and eaten by around the world. But that's grazing cattle is a big reason for deforestation. Um, it can, uh, gosh, I mean, we can, there's just, there's all sorts of things that, that just not eating meat can actually help solve as well. So that's the idea of, of multi-solving. So, um, Finally, just in our, in our closing minutes here, I just, I want you to envision sort of your favorite place or your favorite places, right? And what they would look like in 30 years if they were indeed thriving. Um, what would it take to get there? So just hold that in your mind for a second. What your, take your favorite place or your favorite places, think about what they would really look like if they were thriving, not just getting by, but thriving. And what would it take to get there? And I want to end with this. It's, it's, getting there is not impossible. But the longer we wait, the more difficult it becomes to get there. There's no doubt, no doubt in my mind or, or you know, scientists' minds that are studying this, that the course we're on now is not working for the majority of people um, on, the, on this planet. It's, it's helping a, a very small minority of people, but for the majority of people, the course we're on now is not helpful. Um, and evidence is all around us for that, right? From civil unrest to climate change to increasingly toxic environments to the pandemic that we can't seem to beat. Um, so there's really two shifts that we need. One of them um, is not to be mired in gloom and doom. Um, and instead, think about sustainability as this positive action towards building a healthier, cleaner, more vibrant community. And then the second mind shift is just to realize that you're already playing a role. And that's awesome through your interests and your passion and your work, um, you're already playing this role in responding to the challenges we face. So connecting the dots in our own lives, personally and professionally, um, by doing that, we really see how our, you know, I think it's important to try to connect those dots because it helps us understand and see how our work either moves us towards that place that we want to see in 30 years that's really thriving or away from it. Because um, sometimes our actions move, move away from, from that thriving as well. Um, so with that, um, I would just, I'd like to thank you for attending. Um, if you're interested in thinking more about this, um, about how either you personally or your business can, can um, work towards some of these goals, I'm more than happy to, to, um, to speak with you. Uh, you can see my email address there, mehanc at westerntc.edu. Thank you for viewing this video from Western Technical College Business and Industry Services. Learn more about the hundreds of training and development opportunities available for your employees at westerntc.edu slash BIS.